our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us the true knowledge of you, and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Chapter 2, 
verses 28 through 32. The Lord says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors there shall be those whom the Lord calls. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. We now continue with the psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 31. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. This is this is the Holy Gospel.
over the world spoke different languages. It used to be that everyone could talk to each other just as easily as you and I can talk. Everyone spoke the same language. But instead of using this shared language to obey and glorify God, we read in Genesis chapter 11 that God used this common language to defy God, specifically God's command to multiply and fill the earth. The people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The people were worried about what might happen to them if they did what God wanted them to do. Together, they were strong, but divided, they were weak, or at least so they thought. Now, in response to this direct affront to his command and authority, God said, Come, let us go down and confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's tongue. <coughs> Come, let us. We're reminded here that this is not just God the Father speaking and acting, but the whole triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were about to force mankind to do what they should have been doing all along. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Ever since then, the barrier of language has been something that divides people, along with creating the sort of basic fear and suspicion that comes from not knowing what someone else is saying. This was not something that God had wanted to do, no more so than any parent wants to discipline their child. But sin compelled God to do this. God confused one language into many languages for the purpose of forcing mankind to spread out and fill the whole earth instead of all just staying in one place. In a sense, this division of language has never gone away. In fact, since Babel, it has only increased. People all over the world still communicate in different tongues. But in another sense, this division of language has gone away. It went away on Pentecost. On that day, all the languages of the earth were made one when the Holy Spirit made it possible for the gospel of Christ to be preached in all of them. And we know that this is what the Holy Spirit did. Contrary to what some would like to think, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not give the apostles the ability to speak in holy gibberish, as if there even is such a thing. But he gave them the ability to speak the very real languages that were spoken by the many diaspora Jews who had come to Jerusalem from all over the ancient world. So in the end, God has gotten what he wanted all along. And also you have got what God wanted. God wanted the whole of creation to be filled, not only with people, but also with his word. In order to force sinful mankind to spread out as he had commanded, God divided our language. But then, to bring the gospel of forgiveness in Christ to those sinners whom he had forced to scatter, God put his language of salvation into every language. So now, even though you still don't understand every language and dialect spoken on earth, by the grace of God, you have been made to know and believe the gospel. The Holy Spirit has filled you and the whole world by filling you and the whole world with the gospel of Christ. By this, we have been made to know God and his salvation as being our God and our salvation. Let us now rise as we join in the Pentecost Exordium Hymn, number 399, O Light of God's Most Wondrous Love.
You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One thing that sets Pentecost apart from the other two great Christian festivals of the church year is that Pentecost has not always been a strictly New Testament celebration. Before the coming of the Holy Spirit, on what we have come to know as Pentecost, Pentecost was the Jewish celebration of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. This is why there were so many Diaspora Jews in Jerusalem that day. They had come home to celebrate what was truly one of the most important things in the history of God's people. But those people had barely begun to celebrate when something even more amazing happened. Luke tells us that the coming of the Holy Spirit was signaled by the sound of a great wind from heaven. Maybe imagine the sound of a hurricane on what had been a perfectly calm morning. So this is why, when the disciples went outside, there were many people already there to hear them speaking. And this wasn't by random chance. God wanted the sound of the Holy Spirit to bring these other people out. Because what the Holy Spirit had done on Pentecost wasn't meant to only be for the disciples. Pentecost was meant for everyone. Of course, the disciples were the ones whom Jesus had singled out as his apostolic messengers to the world. And they were the ones to whom the Holy Spirit had given the power to miraculously be able to speak God's word in different languages. But even though that miracle certainly is important, it is not the most important thing about Pentecost. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, through their preaching, many other people were filled with the Spirit, just as we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. But by nature, this is not something for which we are suitable. As we come into this world and then live, each we are not looking for the Holy Spirit or wanting Him to come to us. Instead, each of us is lying in a deep sleep of false security from which we have to be awakened. By nature, we are not concerned about salvation. Naturally, we only care about our day-to-day -day lives and trying to enjoy our lives as much as we can. Now, this does not mean that without the Holy Spirit, we can't realize that there's a problem with our existence. There is a hole in our lives we can't seem to fill. But even the basic realizations that there must be a God and that we are sinners, well, that doesn't mean that we take our sins nearly as seriously as we should. Nor, certainly without the Holy Spirit, can we even begin to find a solution for sin. If we remain like this in our natural sinful states, unaffected by the Holy Spirit, then truly, we have no hope. Without the Holy Spirit, nothing Jesus did for us matters for us. Without the Holy Spirit, all we have is our sins. And all that we can look forward to in the end is the death that our sins deserve. And even when the Spirit comes to us, He doesn't first come and give us the comfort of the Gospel. First, He comes and works in us to the law. Without the Spirit, we already know the law, or at least we kind of know it from our consciences. But when, through the written law of God, the Spirit shows us how much God really demands of us in our lives, that He doesn't just want us to try our best, but demands that we be just as perfect and holy as He is, then the law is changed. Instead of being words on a page or inclinations in our conscience, the law of God is made into a violent storm in which we are adrift on our own with nothing to grab onto and no one to help us. Before showing us Christ, first the Holy Spirit shows us how much we desperately need Christ. Through the law, the Spirit drives us to despair over our sins and creates in us the true realization that on our own we are lost. Now, this first work is not something that we heard about in our epistle lesson today. 
Because the disciples had already been taught by Jesus that they were lost and condemned sinners. But those to whom the disciples preached on Pentecost, they did need this work. We read in the verses following our epistle lesson that speaking for the disciples, Peter proclaimed to the crowds who Jesus was and what he had done. Even though he had committed no crime, Jesus had been killed by the very people to whom he had promised and whom he had come to save. His only crime, if you want to call it that, was that he had claimed to be God's son. But it was not possible for Jesus to be held by death forever. On the third day, following his death on the cross, he rose back to life, and he showed everyone that he was the Son of God, and that everything he had said and done was true. Forty days later, he ascended to the right hand of God. And now, today, everything Jesus promised has taken place. The Holy Spirit has come, and he has made possible everything these people were seeing and hearing. After Peter said these things, we are told that the crowds were cut to the heart, which means they were affected not only in their emotions, but at a much deeper spiritual level by what Peter had said to them. They said, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? This is the same question that we ask when we are shown by God's law the extent to which we have sinned against God and don't deserve his love. But Peter's reply to the crowds on Pentecost is also his reply to us. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The promise of forgiveness and salvation, which God has accomplished through the person and work of Christ, is meant for everyone. And this promise is given to everyone, to whom the Holy Spirit comes and works repentance and faith through God's law and gospel. This is why, in our lives of faith, we can't just hear the good stuff of the gospel, but we must also continue to hear and reflect on the law. Because the work of the Holy Spirit, his full work, is something we need him to keep doing in us for our entire lives. Before the Spirit came to us, we were people who were guilty of having sinned against God and our fellow man. And now that the Holy Spirit has come to us, we have not become perfect individuals who only please God in everything we do and say and think. The forgiveness and salvation the Spirit brings to us for the sake of Christ is not only for who we used to be, but is also for who we are right now and who we will continue to be for as long as we are living on earth. Along with our new Christian natures, we still have our old sinful natures, which means that each and every one of us still has the potential to have the same unbelieving reaction to the preaching of God's word as was had by those who heard the apostles and said that they must be drunk. Those of us whom God has brought into his church, we are not the foundation of that church. We do not keep the church going, nor do we keep ourselves in it. That is what the Spirit does. The Christian church on earth is the body of Christ. It is the sum total of those whom the Holy Spirit has brought to Christ and made part of him through faith and the forgiveness of sins. But without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be part of Christ. Without his work, there would not be one Christian in the entire world. What Jesus accomplished on Golgotha and declared from the empty tomb would be but a footnote that would not have any effect on anyone. We are not Christians because we have found the gospel and read it and decided on our own that it would be a pretty good idea to believe in this Jesus. We are Christians and we are part of the Christian church 
Because through law and gospel, the Holy Spirit has overcome our unbelief and replaced it with faith. Now in doing this, the Holy Spirit has not left us just as unconflicted as we were before in unbelief. But he has begun the conflict that is going on inside of us between our old sinful natures and our new Christian ones. Without the Spirit's continued work, this fight would be one in which we, as individuals, would be coming up against the devil and all the forces of evil in the world. It wouldn't even be a fight. It would just be a walkover. But in this fight, we are not on our own. It's as we confess in the explanation of the third article of the Creed. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. Just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. The day of Pentecost is not when the Spirit began to do this. The Holy Spirit has been working in the hearts of God's people ever since the creation of the world. But Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit made it possible for his work to be done through the gospel all over the world. Everyone needs what the Spirit has to offer. Every sinner needs the redemption from sin and death that can only be had through faith in Christ. Pentecost was when the Spirit made the disciples able to carry out the great commission Jesus had given to them, to go and make more disciples from all nations by preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments. And we have seen the results of this work. We are the results. We, who by no means are of the people of Israel, have still been made God's people. We, who had no right to be pardoned and loved by God, have been pardoned and loved. This has happened for us for the sake of Christ. This has been done for us by the Holy Spirit. On the other two great festivals of the church year, we celebrate great events in the life of Christ. On Christmas, Christ was born, and then on Easter, he rose from the dead. But Pentecost is not an event in the life of Christ. Pentecost is an event in the life of the worldwide Christian church, its first event, its birthday, which means, in a sense, that Pentecost is also your birthday as a Christian. Even though all of us have been brought to faith Many centuries after the events of Pentecost, the events of that day are what set in motion your hearing and believing the gospel. And without them, that never would have happened. But it did. You have heard and believed the word of God. You have been made part of Christ and the church that bears his name. The Holy Spirit has come to you through the gospel, and he has given you the faith the forgiveness, and the promise of eternal salvation that God wants you to have. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, when you filled the disciples with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls were called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified. Likewise, fill our congregation, our synod, and the whole Christian church on earth with the Holy Spirit. Renew us, that the sacraments may be administered faithfully, and that many more will be called by the gospel, enlightened with your gifts, sanctified and kept in the true faith. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all comfort and peace, give to the world that peace which only you can give. Deliver Christians from the hands of persecution. Restore peace to lands ravaged by war. And grant safety to all those in danger. Bring peace to our own nation. In the face of division and tension, let us find peace in you and your unchanging promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, look with favor upon those who serve for our protection in the armed forces. Preserve them from all harm and danger as they serve and defend their neighbors. Keep them ever grounded in faith and Christ's unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, you invite us to come to you as dear children approach their dear Father. Give us childlike faith that we may approach your table with all boldness and confidence. Let us faithfully receive your Son's body and blood with true repentance and contrition, that the sacrament would fortify us to live in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, please look with compassion upon those who are sick, hurting, facing surgery, or downtrodden, especially Sandy, Charlie, David and all whom we name in our hearts. Visit them in their distress. Grant them relief from pain, and let them ever fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the honor. Jesus Christ. 
Christ our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand. For now on this day, as he had promised, the Holy Spirit on the chosen disciples. At this, the whole world rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy.
This is the true body of Christ, given for you. This is the true blood of Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto everlasting life. Depart in peace.
This is the true body of Christ given for you. God preserve you all in the grace of your baptisms until you may one day partake in a stable. Amen. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Continue with the hymn of thanksgiving, number 326, verses 4 and 5.
rise. Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have rejected us with these your salutary gifts. And we pray you of your mercy to strengthen us through them in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. again. I guess you could say Happy Pentecost, even though there isn't really a well-established 
way of greeting fellow Christians on Pentecost. And there also isn't really any kind of commercialism at all for it either. So I bet for some of us, really at no fault of our own, we came in this morning and we're like, oh, it's Pentecost. It's a red day. Because it's like there's not like a special animal for Pentecost. It'd be like a, it'd be like a burning bird or burning hair. Or something that would not necessarily have as much of a commercial appeal. Anyway, so a couple things today. First of all, we are having our mid-year carnational forum. So after service, make your way back to the Bible classroom, grab a soda, have a seat. We'll make it short and sweet. And even if you're not able to stay for the meeting today, do please leave going through the Bible classroom. Because I have laid out on the back wall a big blown up version of the directory. We want to put out a new up-to-date version of that that reflects membership and other changes. So every, every so find your name on there, and if everything is right, put a big obvious check mark for me. I'll never bother you again. Yeah, you don't believe that. Yeah. And if something is wrong, change it. And if your family's not in there, then add it. You, you don't have to find like where you would be alphabetical. I'll figure that out. But just if you're not in the directory, 